supper money playing blackjack. Well, do we eat? Yeah, 6.30. Regular time or daylight saving time? Well, what difference does it make? About two hours. Back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, there existed an underground black film industry that countered Hollywood's stereotypical view of African Americans. These films, which were shown in the segregated theaters of the times, gave black talent a chance to portray positive images of black life in a variety of genres. That's Black Entertainment pulls back the veil of these once hidden films to showcase the groundbreaking work of talented African-American performers. Their work created a legacy that continues today. I'm Mario Van Peebles. Black comedic actors today are literally kings of comedy. They've got agents and studio deals, and they're making bank and doing leads in movies. But that was not always the case. They had to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous Miss Cinematic Fortune like everybody else. The journey was a long one, and it started in the late 20th century. Since the inception of cinema, comedy has always been a favorite movie genre. If you look at the box office results of any given weekend, it's a good bet that one of the top five movies was a comedy. And if you look closer, you'll discover something else. Many of these comedies are headlined by African-American actors. Additionally, many of the most popular and highest grossing comedies of all time have featured African-American leads. If there's a hit comedy playing at your local multiplex, it's probably showcasing the comedic talents of a black actor. In the films of the silent era, black characters were rarely portrayed. When they were, it was usually in a slanderous way. There was this image of the servile um, lazy, um, sloth um, sort of characterization that was um, the white perception of blacks, um, the, the sort of stripped of their humanity. And the, the, the image of, of, of black Americans uh, in early Hollywood films kind of mirrored again um, what was happening in the outside world in terms of the perception, the white perception of African Americans. To add insult to injury, black characters were usually played by white actors in blackface. They even stole our blackness. Would you believe early on a black man couldn't get in motion pictures? The first black in motion pictures was a white man in blackface. Now, in some cases, black actors even donned blackface makeup. Famed African-American comedian Burt Williams was one of those actors. was born Williams Egbert Austin in the British West Indies in 1875. At the age of 10, his family moved to Riverside, California. It was around 1892 when Williams began his career in touring minstrel shows where he was forced to wear blackface. Having black actors play in uh, blackface uh, type stereotypical roles lent a certain amount of credibility to the stereotype. Uh, in other words, it emphasized the truth of the stereotype. Uh, whereas before, if you had a white actor uh, in blackface, it, everyone knew that that was not uh, a, an actual black person. But once you had a black actor acting stupidly and 
foolishly and like a buffoon and uh, grinning and laughing and sawing. Uh, all of that uh, helped to uh, confirm the stereotype because this was an actual black actor behaving stupidly. Today, of course, blackface performances would be considered racist. But despite the stereotypical conventions, Burt Williams was a pioneer in the field of black comedic actors. Burt Williams is probably the best known and perhaps the, the, the one of the finest um, meme performers um, that we have any record of. He's been compared to um, Charlie Chapman. After his stint in minstrel shows, Williams made a name for himself on the vaudeville circuit, as well as on Broadway things that were virtually impossible for a black man living during those times. In 1911, Williams joined the famed Ziegfeld Follies and shared the stage with such legendary talents as Will Rogers, Eddie Cantor, and W.C. Fields. It was Fields, in fact, who said of Williams, Bert Williams was the funniest man I ever saw and the saddest man I ever knew. Another one of Burt Williams' achievements was being one of the first black actors to ever appear in the cinema. He debuted in the 1916 silent short, Natural Born Gambler. Like the minstrel shows, Natural Born Gambler portrays many racist stereotypes common of the time. But shining through is the incredible acting ability of Burt Williams. In the film, Williams portrays a man who enjoys a game of poker with a group of friends. The game is cut short, however, when the police stage a raid. All of the participants are hauled into court, but all are released, with the exception of Williams. At the end of the film, Williams performs an incredible scene that shows why he was considered a pantomime artist beyond compare. Natural Born Gambler was one of the first steps to comedic success for black actors. And the road would continue well into the next century. But like all roads, it'd get bumpy at times. Over the next 20 years, the film industry grew. And Hollywood became the undisputed capital of movie making. And legendary studios were born. The industry even developed a new innovation, sound technology. Now you could do more than just watch a movie. You could also hear it. <laughs> With movies becoming a popular pastime, Hollywood jumped in to meet the demand by producing dozens of films. It also began to use black actors to portray black characters. Comedic black actors in particular found numerous parts, but their roles 
were certainly not the most flattering. Black comedic actors usually played servants, never the leads, but as comic relief to white actors. Comedic black characters of the time were also stereotypes, frequently slovenly and superstitious. Of the black actors who found themselves playing stereotypical characters in Hollywood films, both Mantan Moreland and Stepid Fetchett managed to stand out. Born in Louisiana in 1901, Mantan Moreland's life as a performer began at the tender age of 12. It was then that he ran away and joined the circus. Like Burt Williams, Moreland also worked the vaudeville circuit, and later he made his way to Hollywood. Moreland is perhaps best known for his portrayal of Birmingham Brown, the local chauffeur to the master detective Charlie Chan, in 15 films made by Monogram Studios in the 1940s. He was a, like the comic side, sidekick for a white actor, um, and uh, his performances were, were to provide the levity, to provide the, um, the brilliance of the white actor. His persona was always the same man, you know, slightly baffled by circumstances and uh, always kind of aware to make sure that someone was going to jump out and grab him. But by and large, he was a likable character. You know, he didn't, his stereotypical presentation didn't make us look too bad or feel too bad. We liked Mantan Moreland. You know, he was not all that bad. Mantan Moreland was always rolling his eyes and being a silly, you know, uh, type of person, uh, and uh, stupid, of course. That was a very necessary quality that these uh, stereotypes uh, were, were required to uh, have, and so he fulfilled that. Stephen Fetchett was another black actor who served as comedic relief in Hollywood films of the time. Fetchett was born Lincoln Theodore Monroe Andrew Perry in 1902. His stage name was derived from a favorite racing horse. Fetchett's film career began with silent films, and he continued with the advent of the talkies. He frequently played slow-witted characters in Hollywood productions, and like other black roles of that era, they were stereotypes. He was a specific caricature of black human behavior, a stereotype. He was a perfect example of stereotyping. We saw him, we laughed at him, but we also understood that, you know, at the end of the week, he had a lot of money to take to the bank. And we could appreciate that Mr. Lincoln Perry, uh, which is what his name was, could go to the bank. Uh, we uh, didn't truly appreciate the fact that in order to do that, he had to be the stereotype, slow-witted, dull-minded, you know, imitation of a human being. But we know where it came from, and we also knew that it did pay the bills. So we could say, okay, Lincoln, we know. We know what you're doing. We don't like it, but we understand why you're doing it. So we accept it. But man, it is truly a stereotype, and therefore it is a drag, and it is a downer, and it is something that we really don't like as a people. He, he made a, a fortune. Um, working in Hollywood, a fortune which he kind of ignited and burned. Um, I think that, the, I mean, the amount of money he was paid, unlike Haddon McDaniels, who, you know, who said, um, I'd rather play a maid than be a maid, based on, on, the, on the kind of salary that she could commandeer playing maid's roles in Hollywood. Um, compared to the salary that, salary that she would have earned, you know, working as a maid. Um, Stephen Fetchett, um, being a comedian and, and performing as, as he did in, in Hollywood films, um, kind of lost his, his, his humanity. He, um, I think in, in, in the long run, he was performing almost for the money and not for himself. Uh, and he lost um, connections with himself. Um, and he paid a heavy price, I think, for that um, in terms of his personal life. Uh, and I mean, the fact that I mean, the, the amount of money that he made at any time in, his, in the latter part of his career, 
his having to apologize, um, you know, is, is very painful to think about and, 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 to, and to watch. Um, because he should have, um, he should have been an artist, he should have been allowed to be the artist that he was. Today, people disagree over the images that Moreland and Fetchett portrayed. Should their characters be forgotten as racist stereotypes of a less enlightened time? Or should these actors be remembered for their expert comedic skills and contributions to the black experience in cinema? Mantan Moreland, I've always said, he invented the coffee break and the cotton patch. So I always liked old Mantan because I could see way down and back into the depths of slavery that slave who figured out a way not to let the master work him to death, but on the other hand, to work the master to death. No, uh, uh, Stephen Fetchett, there were some positive aspects to what he was saying and doing. In the major films that Hollywood was producing at the time, black comedians were forced to take marginalized, demeaning, stereotypical parts. Clearly, Hollywood was not about to produce anything that would yield any other kind of role. Well, if Hollywood wasn't going to do it, who was? Though segregation in the first half of the 20th century unfairly divided people by race, it also led to an interesting phenomenon. Throughout the country, there existed movie theaters strictly for African-American audiences. These theaters frequently showed low-budget, B-grade cast-off films from Hollywood. And when they did show Hollywood A-list pictures, it was long after they had been exhibited in theaters designated for white audiences. During the time, it would be virtually impossible for Hollywood to make a film with black themes and black leads. It would not deliver the ever-important box office returns that studios live for. But in the black theaters, it was another story. There was a built-in audience who would pay to see black-themed pictures. Most of these films were shown in black theaters all across the country. Uh, there were something like 1,200 uh, black theaters that catered exclusively to black audiences because black audiences were not allowed in the early part of the 20th century to sit in theaters uh, that, uh, where white audiences uh, could be seated. In response to Hollywood films where black characters were secondary to whites, an independent black cinema movement arose. Now, these so-called race films were made strictly for black theaters. They were made for African Americans, and many of them were made by African American talent, not only in front of the cameras, but in many cases behind as well. While these films were frequently made on shoestring budgets, they gave black audiences a chance to see African American characters take center stage, and not serve as stereotypical foils to white characters. I knew that there was a circuit. I knew that uh, the films that were made by the independent black producers could be seen on the circuit. There was times in the smaller communities where there was no theater uh, that the independent filmmakers would come and bring their own equipment, uh, set up their films, and we would gather uh, in a school auditorium these films encompass such genres as dramas, westerns, and oh yeah, of course, comedies. These comedies gave black comedic actors a chance to show off their comedic skills for the pure sake of comedy. Some actors, such as Mantan Moreland and Stephen Fetchett, alternated between appearing in mainstream Hollywood films and independent black films of that era. But both may have gotten smaller paychecks when they acted in the low-budget black indies but they receive better roles. I think that the independent roles um, did concentrate more on the artist as a, as a comedian as opposed to um, a dehumanized um, black character. With comedy in particular, audiences weren't laughing now so much at Moreland and Fetchett's characters as much as laughing with them. When you see these stereotypical characters uh, uh, portrayed in these all-white films, then you really get a sharp, a racist, uh, negative impression of black people. If you see them, however, in a black cast film uh, made by black producers generally, 
they are simply one type of personality in a community of other types of people. So in that sense, uh, there isn't the feeling of a racial uh, commentary, a negative racial commentary being made by the film producer. Mantan Moreland appeared in a number of films for black audiences. He rode the range as the comedic sidekick in a few black westerns, but he's best known for the numerous comedies that he headlined. One of Mantan Moreland's many comedies for black audiences was 1941, Lucky Ghost. In the film, Moreland plays Washington Delaware Jones, a down-on-his-luck gambler. His sidekick, Wallingford Jefferson, is played by Florine E. Miller. Miller was a regular player and occasional screenwriter of black audience films, and he co-starred with Moreland in a total of ten films. Jefferson is more concerned with finding their next job, while Jones can only think of their next meal. Don't you know that I'm hungry? Ain't you never heard what the good book said? Man don't live with bread alone. Yeah, man don't live without bread alone either. I've been drinking so much water that my stomach think I'm taking in washing. Or oh, any job, I don't care, just so we get something to eat. I just want to find out how food tastes once more. While he may not have a job or his next meal, Jones does have a way with a pair of dice which he uses to attract the attention of two high rollers. Well, Dawson, I hear some. Me too, Bill Brown. Well, excuse me, gentlemen, I didn't see y'all. Two sevens in a row. You're pretty good. Bet you can't do that again. Uh, is you talking money or just conversation? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I like up to my talking. Uh, would you like to join the conversation, brother? Oh, I don't mind speaking a word or two. Well, you gentlemen sure carry around a pocket full of wood. Yes, sir. That's the loudest quiet talk I ever saw. Go ahead. Let me see you do it again. Go ahead. Uh, do it again? Do it again. <laughs> Baby, they don't believe you. Come on, show them in your own language. Come on, show Go on to get them, Wally. Come on. Go on to get them. Let me do. Go, go. It did it again, didn't it? Darn if it did. At the end of Jones's round of dice throwing, there are two new high rollers ready for a night on the town. When the gas run out. That's the Judas Blake Sanitarium and Country Club. No, sound bad. Uh, you think you'd like it, gentlemen? Is it high class and all that sort of stuff, my man? Yes, sir. Nothing else but suits me. Continue, lad. Continue. Jones and Jefferson head to the local country club, where, due to their now snazzy appearance, they're welcomed with open arms. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Walk this way, gentlemen. Inside, Jones becomes infatuated with hostess Florence O'Brien. Oh, how do you do, Miss Hostess? How do you do? How did do, Mrs. Hostess? How is Mr. Hostess and all the rest of the little hostesses? <laughs> and gains an enemy in owner Brutus Blake, played by Maceo B. Sheffield. Now, Sheffield was another frequent co star of Moreland and usually played the villain. Sensing that he can fleece Jones, Blake invites him to his illegal gambling den. Much to Blake's dismay, Jefferson hits a winning streak. Hop on this gravy train, it's leaving. Hello, bro. Ha! Here we go. <laughs> Don't miss it. Seven. Hot dog. Now we get getting warm. <laughs> now the noise of all this carrying on reaches a nearby cemetery 
and awaken some angry ghosts. That's the last I remember. Brother, if I was you, I'd lay off that gym. No, it wasn't that at all. I tell you, I've seen him and heard him with my own ears. Being the ancestors of the nefarious Buddhist Blake, they're none too happy to see what he's made of their old home. After Jones breaks the bank, Blake has nothing else to bet except for the country club itself. Reluctantly, Jones rolls the dice. <laughs> I tell you what I'll do, boys. I'll make a sporting proposition with you. I'll bet you the house here against what you got in front of you. Uh, overruled. We done. Jones and Jefferson throw a party to celebrate the club's new management. But it happens right when the ghosts decide that they've had just about enough. <laughs> the ghosts' first order of business is to kick out their black sheep of a nephew. Uncle Andrew, where is you? Right here. And I have come back to tell you that we are thoroughly ashamed of you and the way you've been running this place. Now get out and keep going. Next, the ghosts target the club's patrons. Do you mind if I join you? Ghosts also strike up the band in their own unique graveyard fashion. Come on, my dear, come on, turn the lights on. Turn the lights on, come on, dear. Finally, the ghosts go after the new owners of the country club. Jones and Jefferson quickly discover that escape is impossible from their ghoulish host. Watch your hurry, boys. <laughs> Come here. Me? Come here, both of you. Put all that sinful money that you've won down here on the table. Look, uh, uh, Mr. Ghost, we didn't win no money, did no, we? No, no, no. It was just, that's what It's in your right hand pocket. Go, go, you know everything. Yes, sir, Mr. Ghost. There it is, right there. That'll knock him to go now, Mr. Ghost. Come back here. And them diamonds, too. <laughs> oh, Mr. Ghost, you know the diamonds we had. That all. That's all. That's all. It's gone. Now I'm get. I'm get. And don't never come back. Go <laughs> along, so boys. Like Mantan Moreland, Step and Fetch it also found roles in comedies for black audiences. One was a 1945 short, The Big Timers.
in the picture, Fetchett plays a porter at a Sugar Hill Hotel. One of Fetchett's co-workers is a chambermaid played by Gertrude Saunders. You better excuse me. I can get it. You can get somebody with Saunders' on-screen daughter falls in love with an army officer who hails from a wealthy family. When they request to meet the mother of their son's paramour, Saunders quickly puts a plan in motion and enlists Fetchett's help. I'll tell you, the guest will be here any minute. Just let's get him out of the way. Let's get him into that clothes closet there. Yes. Well, let's see. Here. Yes, sir. Oh, dear. Oh, just drag him out of the way. Yes. Hey, wake up and... Well, Fearing that the family won't allow their son to marry the daughter of a chambermaid, Fetchett helps pass Saunders off as the owner of the hotel. Better, darling, this is my mother and father. How do you do? Now let me look at you again. I don't want to rush you two lovebirds, but dinner will soon be served. And after that, you two will have plenty of time to look at each other. Hunter, take Mrs. Flowers and her husband to their room there. Yes. Porter, take Mr. Tom's bed. He will occupy that room there. In true comedic fashion, the plan goes awry, and hilarity ensues. Cat lived all alone, scared everything in the shack, called home, and got beat to one poke chop. The cat grabbed the man's shop, put it down, put it down, let it hit the ground. Be no low down hound, cat put it back, drop that skin, ease it back in there, Jim. Let it shower 60 miles an hour. I sympathize with you, but that's tough to see me through. So if you want to stay fat, go get yourself a rat. No kitty, be no clown, snatching rats and stuff ain't sound. Throw it from you, John. Put it down. No, cat, leave it later. Bring it down. Crowd it, just take and slap that skin. Use it in there. Let it shower from 15 miles an hour. Speed the action, cut out the rats and fat. Slide home, throw it from it. Say, but now nah, don't let the big head be hard. Just come around, put it down. Yeah. Suck it to me, yeah. Yeah, just suck it to me, yeah. Independent black films gave Fetchett an opportunity to appear in pictures that weren't always comedies, but still managed to showcase his comedic talent. One of those productions was 1948's Miracle in Harlem. <laughs> Fetchett plays Swifty, a delivery man for a family-run candy store in Harlem. in my room. You know you missed the services tonight. I did. I was just trying to have your room sharp. You like things so clean. The candy and store I is heard. owned by kindly Aunt Hattie, played by Hilda Oafley. Helping her with the operation is her niece, Julie, portrayed by Sheila Guise. Also assisting them is Julie's boyfriend, Bert, played by William Greaves. For which I am to receive 60% and you, 40% of the business. 60 and 40, that ain't but 95 cents in money, isn't it? Uh, Swifty. In Miracle in Harlem, Aunt Hattie's happy operation is disrupted when she's swindled out of her candy shop by a chain store owner. He is soon murdered. <laughs> Despite
despite the murder mystery aspect of the picture, there was still room for some step it, fetch it comedic talent. Uh, what do you want? Uh, uh, see, I was, uh, I am supposed to know what I want. I... Sit down. Miracle in Harlem ends on a happy note with Julie being cleared. Aunt Hattie gets her beloved candy store back and encourages Bert and Julie to go ahead and get married. If you grew up watching television in the early 1950s, this man probably looks familiar. He's Spencer Williams. And he's perhaps best known for his portrayal of Andy on Amos and Andy. The CBS television series was based on the popular radio show of the same name. Amos and Andy was only a small part of Williams' career. Williams was already a major force in independent black filmmaking. In general, the film establishment at that time did not allow black folks to have any creative, i.e., behind-the-scenes roles in production. But Williams at that time had already produced, acted, directed, wrote, a major accomplishment considering those segregated times. Williams wrote the screenplay for the first African-American horror comedy, 1940s, Son of Ngagi. Son of Ngagi tells the story of Bob and Eleanor, a young couple who are married in the film's beginning. <laughs> Eleanor soon meets Dr. Helen Jackson, a colleague of her late father. Dr. Jackson, it turns out, is a mad doctor. Her house holds a hidden trove of riches secreted away in the basement. It also holds something else. Ngagi, a monstrous ape man that carries out her bidding. Don't look now, but there's a great big man right behind you. <laughs> Listen, Helen, that gag's as old as the hills. Why, they've even set it to music. Is that so? Well, that's just fine. Because Ngina likes music, don't you, Ngina? Stop! Stop! By the way, Zeno, did I understand you to say that you were taking some gold or something? No, all I want to do is get out of here. After Ngagi drinks an experimental potion, he turns savage, which leads him to kill Dr. Jackson. <coughs> With murder afoot, the police get involved. In this case, it's Detective Nelson, played by Spencer Williams. He usually took roles in the films that he wrote, produced, or directed. Eleanor Ruth Lindsay, all my property, both real and... It is provided, however, that the said real property must never be sold, given away, or otherwise relinquished, and that the said Eleanor Ruth Lindsay shall occupy and live in the house at 1313 Wellman Road as her home as long as she should live. And... So you didn't know the old doctor, eh? Yet she made her will in favor of your wife, and it's dated this very day. Honestly, Mr. Nelson, I don't know what you're talking about. And he didn't do it either. Boy, you're going to have a lot of explaining to do before you go on your honeymoon. All right, boys. Take him away. In addition to the thrill, Son of Ngagi allows Williams to show off his comedic abilities. Son of Ngagi ends in typical movie monster fashion. Eleanor is carried off by Ngagi, but she's saved by Bob and Detective Nelson. A fire breaks out, and Bob and Eleanor fight their way out through the flames. Yeah. 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 
Son of Ngagi was only a warm-up for Spencer Williams' comedic sensibilities. He took it all one step further with 1947's Juke Joint. Williams wrote and directed the film and played the role of Bad News Johnson. Bad News and his sidekick, Cornbread Green, played by Robert Orr, who acted under the stage name of July Jones arrive in a new town with only 25 cents between them. Well, here we are. Uh, Bad News and Cornbread agree to professionally coach Honeydew in exchange for free room and board. Yeah. Are you jealous for the theater? Are you actors? Actors? Oh, madam. The word actors is a vulgar name for our chosen profession. We are thespians. Then perhaps you'll give my daughter a few lessons before she goes to the theater tonight. Well, now, Mrs. Holliday, the gods of luck have frowned most favorably upon you this day. Watch this. You there, slavey. Go into the palace and tell Caesar I'm here. Tell him I come not to praise him. And if he don't send my wife home to cook my supper, I will slay him. At two, Brutu. Avast, be gone. Ah, there you are, my sweet. I waited for long without. Come, let us go and prepare the feast. How was that? Oh, Mr. Whitney, that was simply grand. If you could only show my daughter how to act like that, why, I'll give you and Mr. Green a room here in my home as long as you want it, for free. One, two, three, and 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 four, five, six. No, 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 Mr. Green. You know there's only three counts in this man. You remember this number? Now you know you help me to arrange it. And there are... When Mama Lou starts to worry about her family's whereabouts, Bad News and Cornbread go looking for them at the juke joint. Honeydew's older sister, Florida, is also at the club and plans to run off with Johnny, the juke joint's owner. But when Mama Lou gets wind of this, she heads off to the juke joint with her trusty umbrella. And guess who are you? I'm Harlife, Honeydew's new boyfriend. Yes, and when I get to it, too, you'll be alone, eh? Get that man! Get that man! Get out of there! Get out of here! Get out of home! Get out of home! So, movie theaters weren't the only things segregated in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. If you were a black comedian, it was rare to perform at a club where there were a large group of white patrons. So most black comedians found themselves performing for mostly black audiences on the black circuit, for the black folks. Some of these comedic performances were filmed and released to black theaters. One of those films was 1945's Open the Door, Richard. It serves as a showcase for comedian Dusty Fletcher. <laughs> I'll go back and break up his jaw. Getting mad because I won't buy no drinks. It ain't no use of me buying when everybody else is buying. <laughs> I ain't been buying no liquor and I ain't gonna start it now. I'm gonna keep on drinking to everybody's health until I ruin my own. Dusty Fletcher did a routine and uh, the routine was called Open the Door, Richard. The film version of Fletcher's act, shot before a live audience, highlights one of his most remarkable bits, that of a stumbling drunk. Fletcher made this role popular years before Red Skeleton launched a very similar character. Now, I didn't know I knew my life, and I know I... Well, I was high and I was drunk. But it ain't no use for me 
in too high enough. <laughs> but I'd get in, I bet a man I'd get in, I'd clam up on shelves, but I didn't know he was going to tell me that. I didn't know how to live my life. I bet a man I'd tell me that. I'd get in. I, I don't need rich. I'll get in. Oh, why don't you open my door, Richard? Open the door, Richard, with such a success that Fletcher found himself billed sometimes as Open the Door, Dusty Richard Fletcher. He was thus billed in 1947's Killer Diller. Killer Diller wraps a narrative story around entertainers such as Fletcher. Oh, yeah. Former vaudeville star Jackie, Moms, Mabley, and Butterfly McQueen, best known for her portrayal of Prissy in Gone with the Wind. With me, but not a in that jail. The film is loosely tied together with the antics of a magician who appears and disappears at the theater from time to time. Well, uh, it's empty now. And, uh, it ain't nothing in that one either. films such as Dusty Fletcher's were the archetype for more modern films that showcase leading black comedians and performers. As the 1940s gave way to the 50s, change was in the air. Integration became federal law. As a result, black theaters and the low-budget movies that played exclusively within them died out. But these theaters and films did not go away without leaving a legacy, although it took time. Hollywood would soon recognize what black independent filmmakers knew from the get-go, that black comedians could carry an audience with black humor and black stories. Today's comedic black talent headline multi-million dollar Hollywood productions. They walk on a road that was paved by the previous black actors who had little to no say in the roles that Hollywood offered them. So today, you don't have to go to some special theater to see good black comedic actors working. You can go right to your local multiplex. That's right. Black comedic actors have carved out a permanent place. And with their skills, their timing, and their brilliance and their wit, they're going to keep races of all of us laughing for a long, long time. And laughing is a good thing. Three and one. One, two, three, and one. 